Hello and welcome back to irisracing.com's Jump To It betting preview show for this weekend. Now, it does feel a little bit like the calm before the storm, in all honesty, because obviously the Cheltenham Festival now, not far away, but we still have lots of good, interesting races to bet on this weekend. And joining me, as ever, is betting expert Stephen Harris and Ed Quigley. Ed, I want to start with you. Just thank you for stepping in as a host of duties last weekend. Just wanted to get your thoughts on what you're looking forward to most this weekend, considering obviously the mind is on Cheltenham, but there is still some good action this weekend. Yeah. Hi, everybody. Hi, Joe. Yeah, absolutely. Um, no problem at all stepping in. Yeah, I know you were off to uh, Legoland or whatever you were doing um, <laughs> during the half turn break, but no. Um, yeah, exa exactly. Uh, it is a little bit of that. I think you, you put it correctly. Most eyes are on Cheltenham with it two and a half weeks away from now. But this meeting, when I say this meeting, the Kempton meeting in itself traditionally has been one that has had a lot of uh, Cheltenham pointers. More specifically, the Adonis has a, a pretty decent record of getting horses who've got involved in the Triumph uh, Hurdle or the, the Boodles, uh, the old Fred Winter as it is known as well. So, yeah, there'll be plenty of clues throughout the card and with the Pendle and, of course, the big three-mile handicap as well uh, on that card. So definitely stuff to take note of. And then we've got the Ida as well up at Newcastle. So, yeah, that naturally we were kind of uh, Cheltenham-centric at this time of year. But uh, the racing in itself at Sunbury Venue and elsewhere is definitely worth keeping an eye on. And uh, Stephen, I want to bring you in as well. I'll just take you back to last weekend. You were laying Shishkin. Uh, so let's oh. talk us through your review oh, of that. Yes. Yes. <laughs> this, is, this is going back to the old days of Shane. We used to get weekly <laughs> wind-ups and, and things had gone wrong. And thank you for bringing that up. No, it was a very expensive race. I mean, they're only in mitigation. I actually laid it uh, a place first two and a place first three. And, and I was immediately sort of in banging trouble because the horse travelled and jumped. Uh, as though he was right back sort of 18 months ago before before his last two starts. I mean, fair play to Henderson. What a brilliant training for us. The, the old misery in me, Joe, does just wonder quite what that race became, I have to admit. Uh, and it won't be stopping me laying him if he ends up being sort of five to four evens in the Ryanair, which I think will still be quite a competitive race. Um, you, you'd have to wonder whether he'll do it twice. He's obviously also had plenty of problems, but I mean, there's no doubt. Got that completely wrong and paid according. The horse I back, Miller's Bank, um, he ran another absolute stinker. Right? He was really disappointed, particularly um, afterwards. I was sort of scratching my head, wondering where it had all gone wrong. And the horse that finished second, Pick Dory, well, for me, Miller's Bank probably should have beaten Pick Dory earlier in the season at Huntingdon. But, I mean, he was three fences behind Pick Dory for most of the race last Saturday. So, that was an expensive failure, Joe. Thank, thank you for bringing that up. <laughs> no worries. I think it is actually, though, like in all seriousness, a good lesson for punters. And maybe, maybe you could just talk a little bit about how you do take these ones on the chin. Yeah, I mean, you've got to move on. You, if your opinion's any good, you'll be okay in the long run. But it, it's all about prices, you know. Um, Shishkin, I mean, I think we said on the show, didn't we, there is always a chance that he'll bounce right back to his best and win because I mean it, on his old form he was like a stone better than the other two and I don't think the Irish horse ran his race on the day so you know it was what I thought the value was laying him a place because a you didn't know he'd stay and b you didn't know um, that he was the horse he used to be and I mean I must admit I didn't think he was I wasn't alone in that view uh, I thought that the value was laying a short price that he bombs out altogether rather than sort of five to, well it was seven to two I mean the market knew didn't they? it was seven to two probably when we were doing the recording on the exchanges. And I think he ended up sort of two to one fairly tight. It was less than that for much of the trading on the race. So, no, fair play to Henderson. He's got him back. But I suspect um, I won't be able to help myself laying him again in the Ryanair at a very short price. Hmm. Uh, but yeah, hopefully we've given you a chance to bounce back today. I mean, we'll go straight into the first race on the card. Ed, you'd already touched on it here. The Adonis Juvenile Hurdle at Kempton. First, we're just going to look at the 150. So, Ed, take us through your thoughts on this one. Very strong on the favourite, I think. Yeah, indeed. Just very briefly on Shishkin, uh, Stephen. I, I think he'll start odds on. He could be very mm. short. When you actually look through who's going to line up in the Ryanair, you you could be pushing the lay button for all sorts at about 8 to 11 or, or there mm. or thereabouts, uh, given that we could have a six or seven runner race. But, yeah, back back to this assignment. Uh, the 150, it's a good little contest, this, isn't it? Uh, yeah, I'd be with Scriptwriter. I think he's the best horse in the race. Uh, yes, he's penalised. 
But uh, I thought it was a pretty good run in defeat. He enhanced his claims in defeat last time out uh, in that Grade Two Triumph trial on Trials Day at Cheltenham, beaten three quarters of length by Comfort Zone. Uh, well, the assessor officially believes that is the case because his rating has gone up two pounds despite being beaten. And watching that race back again, uh, I mean, he travelled very well and then just got worried out of it. I thought uh, up the hill on very tacky, gluey ground uh, by a horse we know stays well on soft. And um, look, this script writer is no mug at all on the flat. He's a horse with a good turn of foot. Um, if you, you know, back through his flat form, I mean, he was beaten six <coughs> lengths by Caribus in a group three. You would think Caribus went on to win the uh, 2000 guineas. I think this is much more a relative test of speed for script writer here around Kempton on good ground. <coughs> uh, this will... This will suit much more his kind of flat credentials, if you like. And look, all in all, he's taken very well to hurdles, hasn't he? Bolted up at Sedgefield in a nothing race, got the job done at uh, Cheltenham's November meeting in a grade two, and then uh, went down only in the final kind of 50 yards on soft ground by comfort zone last time out. So, uh, yeah, I think script writer back on a quicker surface round here. Um, I think he'll take a lot of beating. There are some interesting horses in here. I know Stephen will come on to one in due course. But uh, the joker in the pack is Nuzret, who, um, yeah, I've got to be careful I don't get legal teams after me here. But, uh, I mean, the, they've kind of been saying that the Boodles is the plan for this horse. Well, uh, I would have thought if you want, you, you rated one two eight. If you want to kind of go and win the Boodles, the last thing you need to do here is come to the Adonis and go and stuff scriptwriter. Um, because then you're, you, you know, you're almost handicapping yourself out of the boodles. You're gonna have to then go the triumph hurdle route. So, <laughs> I mean, uh, for one, one of a better phrase, I mean, are there other days in mind here? Uh, if you see what I'm saying, um, because if they go and win this by default, they're in the triumph hurdle of which we've seen, you know, the horse was lapped by lossy mouth in Ireland last time out and they could end up falling between two stools. So I thought it was a bit strange personally, Joe, uh, if you were looking for a prep run for the boodles, you'd want something a little bit more discreet. Mm-hmm. Um, rather than it's kind of win and you handicap yourself out the boodles. And uh, if you drop out the back of the television here, you might be too lower down the weights to get into it. Anyway, that's one for another day. But script writer for me, I think he's the best horse in the race. Yeah, and Stephen, as um, Ed alludes to as well, I think you've got a different view. Does the, the, the yard form actually of script writer here trouble you or does that put you off? Well, no, that's a good point, Joe. I was going to say about Milton Harris. Fantastic season, fantastic train. It'd been a revelation. It'd be miles for his best season. He's got some lovely horses. Of course, he was virtually out the trade a few years ago. He's come back. Um, he's three from 30 in the last 14 days, Milton Harris. So he's, have, he's having winners. Um, but they were flying along earlier on at a much higher strike rate. So that's one thing. Um, the other thing about script writers, he can't be hit by the stick, allegedly. Now, after he finished second behind Comfort Zone uh, at Cheltenham, a lot of the pundits on racing TV that I watch thought the saddle had slipped and because um, Paddy was all over the place, to be quite honest with you. But anyone who's been watching Paddy Brennan ride for the last few years will know that that's not unusual. He still wins a million races, but he's a mess. I mean, in a finish, he, lo- he looks like he's about to fall off a lot of the time. He, and when they hit near the winning line, he stands up in the irons as though he's sort of in agony. And he's just get- But I mean, that's only my opinion. I could be miles out with that, but I'd be slightly worried about that at a short price, to be honest. Um, a script writer's probably got the best form. Nuzret has run really well in defeat the last twice in Ireland in warm company. So, as Ed said, it'll be a good chance to compare the merits of the, the juvenile form. The, the one I actually like, I've, I've gone for potential rather than form uh, here with Rare Middleton. I think he cost 215,000 guineas. Um, he, was, he ran twice on the flat, uh, winning on one occasion. He won an egg and spoon race at Taunton, but I really like the way he did it. I mean, he was a bit green early. But his hurdling sharpened up and he basically won pulling a bus against nothing. I mean, Nichols has got a million horses at home to compare him with. I think it's very significant he's running him here. And I think they're using it out as a finding out mission. I, I suspect he may end up at Aintree rather than Cheltenham unless he absolutely bolts up. He might be more of an Aintree horse um, on good ground. A flat track might suit him. But Kempton... Good, good ground. It should be ideal for him. I just thought uh, earlier in the week he was sort of six to one, and you sort of know where you are with the front two. It's a really good level of form, but maybe Rare Middleton might improve past both of them. All right, I think that sums it up pretty nicely. So potential value there, Rare Middleton, and Ed very keen on the favourite. All right, let's move on to the two twenty-five to so the Pendle Novices Chase. And Ed, I know I think we've spoke about it before a long time ago as well. That's all right, Gino. 
for Jamie Snowden. Mm-hmm. I know you've been keen on him for a while. Just take us through his season. Um, and yeah, is he kind of worrying you or have you been impressed with him so far? Well, I mean, Jamie Snowden himself is having uh, an absolute season to remember, isn't he? It really has been uh, all things great for the uh, the Lambourne Yard. He's got a lovely uh, crop of horses to go to the Cheltenham Festival with. Uh, you wear it well, passing well. A uh, Gar Law, of course, holds entries in the in the Ryanair and the Gold Cup as well. Sounds like he may uh, roll the dice from one of those two. So, yeah, Jamie Snowden's yard been going well. That's right, Gino. I've uh, been having a very good season. He himself holds entries at the Cheltenham Festival, including the plate over two and a half miles. So again, I'm sounding like a broken record here, but uh, if you thought you were well handicapped and you wanted to go and win the plate at the festival in three weeks' time, you don't really want to come here and win by 15 lengths because that's that game over and you're, you're looking at eight tree. But Jamie Snowden says, well, look, this is a good pot in itself. Um, let's not look a gift horse in the mouth. We think we've got a, a really, really good chance here to scoop the best part of 35 grand to first place for a small field. And yeah, he's got to come into the equation here, hasn't he? I mean, he was a good run behind stage star last time out over two and a half where he, he showed he needs that trip these days. Uh, he's kind of lost a little bit of that, that zip of youth, which he showed over the minimum trip. And yeah, I mean, he, he's a worry to Boot Hill, isn't he? He's got to be. Uh, although the, the big tick in the box of Boot Hill is he appears to absolutely love going right handed and loves flat tracks like Kempton uh, as a record of two from two at the Sunbury venue on the CV would kind of testify. So it's a bit of a muddling old affair, this one, uh, Joe. I mean, the, the horse we shouldn't forget in here uh, is Solo, who is form in itself, I don't think is unbelievable. But I think Paul Nichols has won this about 28 times since he took out his training license. Uh, he absolutely farmed this race. I think he won it six times on the bounce or something ridiculous um, in the early part of the noughties. And he's won it the last two years with similar horses, uh, Pick Dorhi and Tamarack Dumatan, who kind of had uh, quite exciting juvenile slash novice hurdle campaigns and then took a, a bit of slow burners over fences, shall we say. And so it is amazing to see that um, Solo is only still seven. Seems to have been around forever. So he's had a wind operation. He's in receipt of weight from Boot Hill uh, for Paul Nichols, who just places his horses fantastically well, including on the Saturdays. I and mean, we've called him Mr. Saturday for pretty much all this season. He does seem to have so many of these races sewn up. Um, so all in all, Joe, convoluted way of, of saying, I think this is too tricky to have any strong opinions about Boot Hill, the most convincing, but is naturally penalised for earlier exploits. And that brings all the others into it. So, uh, yeah, a bit of a tricky race. I'm happy to sit out. But there's definitely clues coming out of this with bigger targets ahead. Yeah, and Stephen, for you, any angle into the race? I basically agree with Ed there. I think there's three runners. Um, I don't fancy the other two. Tweed Skirt was beaten in a mare's race behind Jeremy's Flame, who's a runner at Cheltenham. So it's not terrible form, but I suspect this is a much better race. And the other one, JJ Riley, scrambled home in a handicap here the other day. Don't think that one's good enough. So three runners for me. I think you can make a good case for all all of the front three. I, I prefer That's All Right Gino because I think that handicap form at Cheltenham's good. And Stage mm. Star, which won that, um, steered up right up the inside under Cobden, got a brilliant ride. And I think that was an advantage on the day, whereas That's All Right Gino was much wider and conceded first run, but stayed on really strongly. I mean... Uh, um, Ed said it, and he's right, about uh, Jamie Snowden. All of his horses are absolutely brilliantly progressive, and they, they give their running every single time. They, I can't remember the last time I thought one of his horses run badly, and they, they all seem to be tough and durable and jump well, and they're usually ridden positively by Sheehan. And I think this one is bound to run well. Just to say about Solo, Paul Nichols, who's very good with these sort of horses, that form um, looks pretty good now behind Balco Coastal. He's come out mm. and run a blinder against Jerry Colomb. And the fourth home in that race, Lord Baddersley flew round Plumpton the other day from the front, sluicing up. So that's a bit in fact. The only thing I think was Solo, and I think I'm right in saying this, I think he's had his wind done there, doesn't he? Yeah. And the, yeah. Since then, and, and Paul Nichols is on record as saying that he would have liked another couple of weeks with him. He might be a gallop short. So if that is true, which I always take with a pinch of salt, the market will be very interesting for Solo. You know, I think he's got compelling claims, but maybe he might just need the run. All right, fair enough. Uh, let's move on now to the bigger race on the cart at Kempton. So the three o'clock, the Coral Trophy Handicap Chase over three miles. Ed, take us through your thoughts on this one. You've got a few big names in here. You have indeed. Uh, horse number one, uh, you kind of stopped the party there in terms of big names. Yeah, the 2020 King George winner, Frodon. Uh, look, what it does is it skews this race massively because it puts four horses out the handicap. Um, 
I was going back through it. I haven't got, got it in front of me now. But to have a 161 rated chaser in here, it doesn't happen all that often. I mean, you know, kudos to Paul Nichols. He likes throwing these these big rated horses in the handicaps. And in fairness, Frodon um, got the job done, didn't he? At Wing Canton off 158, he ran in, in the uh, the Badger Beers uh, earlier on in the in the season where Frodon was absolutely smashed up in the betting into nine to four favourite and um, jumped them ragged. Now, I think Father Time may just be catching up with Frodon from what we saw at Cheltenham in the Cotswold chase last time out. Having said that, I think, lumping big weights around against much inferior horses suits him because he does go a fair old gallop for at least two thirds of the race. And I think he'll have a few of these in all sorts of trouble as Brian, he kicks on on the second circuit. My gut feeling is though, as I said, father time is probably just starting to get the better of him and he will fade away, but he has, he does massively alter the dynamic of this, this race. And one of the horses I, I quite like here is from out the handicap. I think could run a big race at a huge price. It's funny enough, it's, it's another Milton Harris representative. So should have got my uh, my hashtag Harris uh, uh, T-shirt on for more than one reason. I think it's fair to say, Stephen, for this week. But um, <laughs> yeah, Jackamar, horse number 11 on the cars. I think he's a bit of a big price here. Isn't he? 25 to 1 on there or thereabouts. Uh, yeah, two pound out of the handicap. But uh, he bounced back to winning ways last time out in a minor event at Leicester. But he seems to have been sparked up by the application of a visor and I thought he was um, far from a forlorn hope here. Some very good form on flat right-handed tracks. And he won on his only previous start at Kempton uh, when he bolted up at the Christmas meeting um, a couple of years ago, a couple of seasons ago or so. So say right-handed, goes on good ground, goes on soft ground, down the bottom of the weights. I believe Paddy Brennan's not on board, or at least one of the reasons Paddy Brennan's probably not on board. And Gavin Sheehan is would be due to 10 stone 2. I think Paddy can do the weight, but he need about nine days in the sauna, uh, whereas Gavin Sheehan can naturally do the lighter weights. But Jack Amar, headgear's perked him up, goes well right-handed, loves the ground. He bolted up the only previous time he ran at Kempton, and he's uh, he's 25 to 1 or there or thereabout. So uh, to new Stevens line, check your each-way terms on the Saturday morning. Look for some five or even... There may be some, uh, some idiots being very generous trying to fill your Cheltenham coffers a fortnight before the festival and going half the field each way, going to seven places or something daft like that. But um, Jack and Mark each way, if you can run into a place or better, I'll be happy. And Stephen, I think you're happy to take on the favourite here as well. Captain Orr only won, won last week. Yeah, I, the run could come too soon for Captain Orr. He's owned by Pally and Marmion. Um, he's been a brilliant advert for Christian Williams. They get down to this mark uh, that he won off Ascot last week. And off they go, and he wins again. I mean, if you watch the run back at Ascot last Saturday, he won at an early stage. He jumped and mm. travelled well. He, he was always looked the winner, and he duly drew clear. He's a straightforward ride. He loves good, good to soft ground. He's going to get that at Kempton. We have had a shower today, so it might just be a little bit of cutting it, which would be ideal. If it doesn't come too soon, he must run really well. He's got the boy over from Ireland. Um, Kean, Kean, is it Kean Quirk, who takes off five? Never had a ride in the UK before. Uh, has been flown over in Ian Marmion's helicopter uh, to arrive at Sunbury <laughs> in time for this race. Uh, you think I'm joking, I'm not. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, he, he should run really well. If it doesn't come too soon, he must run well again. But there are a few in this race of interest. It is a really competitive race. The one Ed has touched on, Jackamar, definitely. Big runner, overpriced, will run well. Um, he had been falling down the weights, um, catching the eye on a few occasions, all of a sudden the money arrives, pound shillings and pence at Leicester. And I thought he did well to win. He got a wide trip at Leicester and the, the winner, uh, the runner-up got first run and he did well to cut him down after the last. He's back in rude health. He's definitely a live outsider. Yeah, be having him winning, he, he could be any price on the exchange, could be 30 or bigger. Um, I'm sure he'll run well. Gavin Sheehan replacing Paddy wouldn't be any bad thing either. Uh, St. Calvados has been ridden by David Maxwell. Both starts so far um, this season. I mean, Dave Maxwell is a brilliant advert for jump racing. He owns the horses. He pays the fees. Uh, he rides them. But he is agricultural, to put it politely. St. Calvados ran here in a match and bolted first run back. And then was quite eye-catching last time when fourth, uh, shaping nicely under a patient ride. Uh, Harry Cobden replacing David Maxwell is probably the greatest jockey uplift you'll ever get in your life. So he must be a big runner. He needs good ground. Nichols says he's trained him for the race. He must run well. And finally, Joe, 45 minutes later, I'm going to get to my selection, which is Killer Kane, who is a Kempton horse, comes from a yard suddenly going well again, Joe Tizard, having had 35 losers in a row after the big freeze. They're now 
going well. He bounced right back to his best at Kempton last time. This is his track. This is his course and distance. Brendan Powell must be right down to his minimum weight. And I think Killer Kane is bound to run well. He, he's 12 or 14 to 1. I think that's a very fair price. But it is a hot race, it has to be said. All right, Stephen. Well, we'll stick with you as well. You're quite keen on Killer Kane. But let's take you over to your long shot selection. So that's in the next race at Kempton. So the 340, the Dovecot Novices Hurdle. Take us through your selection here. Well, actually, I've gone from Milton Harris' horse here, uh, Mullenbeg, who has been running in handicaps. Um, he's got plenty of speed. I think this will be absolutely ideal round here. A sharp two miles, right-handed on really good ground. He's got one run. He doesn't need want to be in front for too long. He needs producing. He's got Jonathan Burke up for the first time. Now, on the ratings, he's got plenty to find um, with horses such as Hansard, Rebound, and You Can Tango. But he's a hard-knocking horse. He's been kept busy. I think he's going to... I'd be disappointed if he wasn't bang there jumping the last. Maybe he won't quite have enough off the bridle against some sort of more up-and-coming horses. But he was 20-1 to 1 earlier in the week. I think that's a really big price with conditions to suit. Yeah, and Ed, your view on this race? Yeah, one I'm probably going to sit out, Joe. Uh, I mean, interesting, Rubo, uh, as you say, for Cobden and Nichols, reappears only a couple of weeks after running in the, uh, the Betfair hurdle where he absolutely lost the plot, that horse, in the sense of I think he was just far too free and keen and, and fell in a hole and it's a bit of a worry because that race was running if i'm not mistaken it, was, it wasn't far off course record pace it might have even been the course record and harry cobden couldn't settle him so no surprise at all to see they put the hood on uh to try and get him to switch off he's one of those horses if he does switch off i got a feeling there's about 10 pound of improvement in him um it's just a case of if because the rare form of what he's achieved isn't looking particularly sparkling he's the most noticeable run was when runner up to rare edition uh it came to over christmas and of course that horse got uh stuffed when while well fancy for the sydney banks at uh, huntington recently so but i just get a feeling it's about what the horse has not done with rubo rather than what he has achieved and uh the fact you know he's back out again so soon with the hood on um if he can just calm down he can whiz around a fast track like here uh it wouldn't shock me if you put in an improved display but uh generally i'm gonna keep an eye on the market if rubo kind of drifted to a big enough price i think he's about seven to two at the moment if i could get a bit bigger i might be interested but for now uh powder dry yeah no worries uh fair enough and let's move over to newcastle for the next race we're going to look at the ida handicap chase and ed again i'll start with you here 15 declared plenty to pick through um but the favorite here what do you make of it yeah, interesting, isn't it? Kitty's light. Um, I mean, look, we, we've we kind of seem, just seems we've always been talking about this horse on this show. Mm. It's, it's it's mainly Stephen talking about all his his friends in high places connected to the uh, <clears throat> the Christian Williams yard. That's pretty much what it is. But uh, yeah, as you say, uh, I mean, wing my wings, uh, wasn't it? Who um, I think won it this last year was it? Am I right? I'm thinking or am I, am I going yeah. mad? But um, yeah, that's right. either way, either way, yeah, I, I just think a bit short for me at the prices. Uh, it has to be said, eleven to four. Um, you know, the hurdy burly 15 runner handicap, not the type of race I'd, I'd probably on balance uh, want to take that type of price about. Uh, although, uh, you know, I do totally respect uh, the horse's claim. So, um, yeah, again, another one that I'm finding a bit tricky to decipher. Uh, I think Sam's adventure looked back to uh, enjoying things, shall we say, last time out. It was gone up five pounds for that, but uh, again, it's a very good form at the track. Uh, two wins here at Newcastle, two placed efforts as well, and I think we'll probably have to be right in the thick of things. So probably eight eight to one versus eleven to four. I'd probably say uh, I'd probably be leaning a little bit more that way if I had to choose between those. But uh, again, a, a race I'm finding it pretty difficult um, to, to get a, an angle in here on uh, on Joe. I just think there's there's too many question marks about all of them. Mm. Uh, if you see what I'm saying, they've got very in and out profiles, and I don't actually think. There's anything in here jumping off the pages obviously well handicapped that's the next thing you go to don't you really and uh, so all in all bit of a mess i'll leave this one to steven yeah over to you then steven well i mean i think this is an absolute certainty which is a strange thing oh, to say right. in a horrible, horrible 50 but i think kitty's like will win barring any calamitous jumping errors i mean he's run three times over marathon trips in the scottish national he's run an absolute blinder and he's run a blinder in two whip reds or the bet 365 as it's called now that's the only time he's sort of been three mile five or further three times he got up to 149 at one point uh, last season he's now 17 pounds lower um you know you've got to choose your words carefully i think the best thing to say is he's been targeted 
at this race. <laughs> I think that's the best way of putting it. Um, he's not been ridden with a great deal of enterprise. He certainly wasn't at Kempton last time out when never really landed a blow in a remote third, but he did show a bit more. Um, Jack Tudor is a brilliant jockey's book. Christian's back in form. We saw that with Captain Ord last weekend. Um, as I say, proven stamina over this sort of marathon trip. Likes good ground, which I think it'll be could even be on the faster side of good at Newcastle. If you remember, they had a meeting there, I think it was a couple of weeks ago, where they withdrew 75% of the runners on the day because the ground was too quick. So I'd imagine they'll make sure it's good or good to soft with a bit of watering. Um, I think Kitty's like is up against a lot of fairly exposed horses here who are not obviously well treated, whereas he has been laid out for this race by a very, very shrewd operation. And while you're looking at sort of three to one, 11 to four, I've half got a feeling that he might be one of those Saturday horses that winds up sort of seven to four rather than 11 to four, because I think he's just been laid out for the day and he has shortened up. He was four to one earlier in the week, but those anti-post markets are so weak, it's virtually impossible for anybody to get on. I mean, you have to wear it. You've got more chance of sort of getting on in a betting shop these days if you've got a baraclava on your head rather than actual cash <laughs> over the counter. Um, so I'm not really sure if anyone's got on yet, but I think there will be plenty of money going on Kitty's Light. And I think as long as he jumps fluently, in his early days over fences, um, he didn't jump fluently, but Christian's a master at getting them to jump when it matters. And he's actually... Uh, Ed was almost saying this. That I checked this because Kitty's Light is only seven. I mean, and he's run 20 times over fences. And that, what we were saying earlier about some of these tracks, that Christian does run his horses regularly and often. And, and they get well handicapped and then they win again and they win again and they win again. And then they go missing for a year because they're too high up the weights. And he's extremely shrewd in making sure those ones happen in these valuable Saturday handicaps. And I think Kitty's Light, um, will take an awful lot of beating. Yeah, so get on while the price is that big, I suppose. Uh, that's the kind of advice there from Stephen. And moving on to the final race we're going to look at in detail. So this is the 2.30 at Fontwell. So the National Spirit Hurdle. Uh, yeah, Ed, take us through us. Again, some big names in here. Goshen returning in Nappers Hill, of course. Just take us through your thoughts on how you would price this one up. Yeah, good little race, isn't it? Um, just the five declared uh, and all the official figures again not much between them are they 156 Goshen 156 So Royale 153 Nappers Hill 152 Voshima uh, brewing up a storm uh, 148 but is in receipt of six pounds so in theory that puts him right in the mix you could the, the, that, the, if this were a handicap the, essentially you could blanket them mm. uh, to use that phrase and uh, so I, I just think that I'm going to go for the horse here who's Potentially on tissue could be the outsider in the field or near and near, near and near enough. That's Prashima uh, for the Skelton team who, okay, bombed out last time out. It was clearly an issue when pulled up behind Champ uh, in the long distance hurdle. But I'm kind of using that as, as you know, the, the barometer because that was a pretty hot race. I mean, you remember that was one of the races of the season we've seen so far uh, with Champ and Paisley Park being separated by a neck. Um, and then Prashima, there was clearly something wrong, was, was tailed off. But should find this a little bit easier, it has to be said. Be given a break. And I thought coming back down to two and a half miles might not be the worst thing in the world. This also shows a fair bit of boot. And when he won it, Weatherby, I don't think he kind of won the race, uh, the, the West Yorkshire hurdle by kind of grinding his opposition into submission. He kind of tanked round in the bridle in a bit of a stop-start race. And uh, Harry Scout pushed the button. I was there that day on the rails at, at Weatherby. And he just took off. Uh, they didn't see which way he went. And I... Look, he, he, he beat them senseless that day by 10 lengths. They clearly, you could put a line through the run last time because there was something not right. You know, he, he clearly was under a cloud for whatever reason. He was set off 5-2 to two to win the long distance hurdle to beat the likes of Champ and Paisley Park. I think he's in much calmer waters here today. Uh, Napa Seal only ran a week ago. I think Paul Nichols kind of running this horse under sufferance. He wants to cash in before the ground goes soft. I think was the phrase I saw the other day. Uh, so Royale, uh, lovable horse as he is. I mean, he's 11 now. He's been trotting over to Ireland and back. Fences, hurdles. He can't be getting any better. Brewing up a storm arrives under a cloud. And then we've got uh, myself and Stephen's favourite horse. And we always predict uh, every time to a nicety on the show. And that is Goshen, who uh, I've got absolutely no idea what he's going to do. I don't think no. the connections do. I don't even think Gary Moore does, um, it has to be said. But... Good ground round here. No idea. Obviously, he's won here before, um, but 
not for me. Uh, I think he's probably going to go off favourite because he's just a, a lovable rogue, for one a better phrase. So, yeah, mm. uh, Aprishima, I think, could be the value pick here. You could get five or six to one. Been freshened up. Uh, the skeletons, you'd imagine, have targeted this for some time. The yard have gone a little bit cold. I was actually looking through the stats. Uh, I mean, Stephen's good on these things. I think they're three from 43 this month. But mm. I was going through the races. Some of the stables, as we say, lesser lights have been running in that time. There have been a few horses at eight or ten to one being beaten around the likes of Hereford. So I, I wouldn't be too concerned as I would normally by that type of strike rate. Yeah, go on then, Stephen. Take it away with your bookmaker hat on. How would you be pricing that? <laughs> well, this, is a, this is an absolute minefield. I mean, I think Ed's sort of called it, really. There's more negatives than positives, isn't there, about all of them? I mean, Goshen, let's be polite and say he just hates jumping fences because he ran absolutely abysmal, again, for the second time over fences last time. Absolutely tailed off. But he's beaten such a long way out. It didn't really look like it was his jumping again. He, he just doesn't mm. look right. He's one of those horses, you, you often watch him and you think he's, there's something wrong with him. Because he looks amiss. And then he'll produce a devastating performance. Um, I mean, he ran really well over hurdles at Kempton, didn't he? He got picked off by Paisley mm. Park, was it? One yeah. start back. I mean, that's the standout bit of form in the race. If he gets back to that. But I'm looking at Fontwell and the weather for because it says good ground at the minute. I mean, this race mm. is usually run in a swamp. I mean, I don't yeah. think Goshen wants good ground, does he? I mean, I can't imagine that's going to suit him. He has one round here, but he did jump out. To his right, I think, when he won a juvenile hurdle here, it was about 15 years ago, it feels like. But So he has won at Faultwell, but he's just an impossible horse to know. I mean, he's probably top of the ratings here by three pounds, I think, from Nappers Hill, isn't he? Nappers Hill um, ran at Wincanton last Saturday. This is definitely an afterthought, this run. Nichols wouldn't have been planning to run him. He had a very hard race. He went off at a really strong pace and got swamped by a, like... I like to move it. What's the horse called, Ed? I like to know. I can't remember yeah, what's called. I like to move it, yeah. Um, I, I like to yeah. Who, who's really impressive is only the winner's only 16 to one uh, for the champion hurdle now, which seems like a very short price, but he was impressive. But Nappers Hill had a very hard race and um, whether or not the Fogwell Hill over this longer trip is exactly what he wants. I don't know. Prashima was disappointing last time. So Royal, I think I've mentioned before, I think he's definitely gone. I think Alan King's struggling a bit with him. So I got left with brewing up a storm in the end. I mean, who's run really well in this race before. He got beaten ahead in it, I think, last time around. Um, Ollie Murphy's horses are running well. He's had three winners in the last 14 days. He's having winners when the money's down. Maybe brewing up a storm's the one to side with. But this is one of those races, nothing would surprise me. I, I can make a very negative case for all of them. <laughs> so potentially lay them all like you did with Shishkin last week. Uh Oh, okay. yeah, no. I mean, it depends on the prices, doesn't it? We haven't seen prices no, yet. Exactly. It's a very hard race to price up. I mean, I guess Goshen will be sort of sixth of all, seven of all, something like that. And I'm, I'm not, you can think of plenty of reasons for taking him on. But then I don't particularly fancy Nappers Hill or So Royale. So, yeah, very tricky race. Maybe the move is to back the rag, uh, the bottom one, brewing up a storm. All right, well, let's get to some tips that you're confident in then, Stephen. Just take us through a summary of your tips that you've gone over already in the show. Yeah, my three bets of the week. Betting expert Nap uh, is Killer Kane in the big handicap at Kempton at three o'clock. He's getting loads of weight. He was really impressive for me in a strongly run handicap over this course and distance last time out. He's got a brilliant record at Kempton. Joe Tizard's flying. I think he's 12 or 14 to one. That is a very competitive race, but I think that's a very fair price. Win only, uh, rather, the each way terms are not in the punter's favour. And the value angle in the 150. Rare Middleton, very much potential rather than form in the book here. But um, Paul Nichols has got loads of horses to measure against in, at this level. And I was really taken with Rare Middleton, who cost 215,000 guineas. And I think he might have a little bit more upside than the front pair in the market. And in the 340, another one at a huge price, hopefully. Milton Harris's Mullenbeg, who's been progressing in handicaps of late. He's a smooth traveller with one sharp turn of speed. And I think Kempton on good ground at two miles should be ideal all right well best of luck to you Stephen, this week and uh ed over to you one horse we haven't talked about yet yeah indeed uh my nap will be script writer for the aforementioned reasons quicker ground compared to cheltenham last time out more of a test of a speed for this former aiden o'brien flat horse uh jack amar the, yeah, the long shot who i think can uh, go well at a price one on his only start at kempton enjoys right-handed tracks don't think uh, a million to get involved here from down the foot of the way. Yeah, Go Dante would be my pick um, over at Shepstow. 
Uh, interesting sort here. There was a lot kind of, of hype around this horse a couple of years ago. A lot was expected of him. Uh, the kind of wheels fell off a little bit, it has to be said, um, where he didn't quite live up to expectation when he, in the end he was well beaten, uh, albeit in the shallow hurdle which is, is a great one behind Stage Star. Uh, he then was uh, off the track for a long time, came back at Utoxeter at last month and was just far too keen, I thought. He travelled well to a point, but despite doing too much early and fell in a hole, look, he would have needed that run, but I also think he, what he did show was the trip was wrong for him. He's had two starts at two and a half miles now. On both occasions, he's travelled well to a point and then the lights have gone out. He's back to the minimum trip. He's also... Uh, been given three pounds back from the handicapper, which I think is very generous, uh, personally, Joe. The form of his race actually is not working out too badly at all, uh, which he was beating you talks to last time out in his comeback. There's been a horse come out and won. I was ahead of him since. So I think that was a good race. He's down in trip here. He's down in the weights. Uh, he's the horse with the most upside to him by a long way, I think, in here. I think three to one is fair for uh, Ollie Murphy team, who's really clicked back into gear this side of Christmas after a real drab runner results and uh, that man sean bowen is on board who's uh, one of the top pilots in in the world of national hunt racing at the moment isn't he, he really is running out of his skin over the last six months or so so yeah go dante for me um i think three to one is fair yeah and the memorable time of 157 at chaps though keep that in mind yeah. um so yeah that wraps it up for today's edition of jump to it so thanks a lot for our experts for uh, their tips hopefully we'll come back with some more winners this weekend uh, and also stay tuned to the irish racing uh, youtube channel for plenty more cheltenham previews coming your way very soon as well as well as the irish angle with vincent johnny and emma as always and if you do place a bet as always please do gamble safely and we'll see you again very soon